At the outbreak of war in 1914, Arthur Curry was an amateur soldier. By the end of the war in 1918, he had become the most successful general of the Great War. The boy from Strathroy, Ontario, defeated the Prussian military elite and outclassed the professional British generals. He had crafted a military machine, the Canadian Corps, to the highest level of efficiency. And it was during the last 100 days of the war that he won his greatest battle. We retrace his steps in the last 100 days of the war and discover how he won these victories and find out how he became the most famous Canadian of his time and why he was forgotten. I'm military historian Norm Christie. I've been touring the old Western Front for 30 years by visiting the famous and not so famous cemeteries and battlefields. You'll get a unique perspective on the war and the men and women who fought it on the Great War Tour. We're driving through France near the city of Amiens. We're heading to the site of a battle which is one of the turning points of the Great War. Nothing remains of the Great Battle except the small cemeteries in the farmers' fields that contain the graves of the Canadians who died there. This is Toronto Cemetery and it's one of a dozen war cemeteries that marked the battlefield of Amiens. It was at Amiens that Arthur Curry had his first great victory of the last 100 days of the Great War. A lot had changed since Passchendaele in 1917. Under the leadership of Arthur Curry, the Canadian Corps became different. With a new attitude, they became a uniquely Canadian force. From over here, you get a great view of the battlefield. In 1918, the British Army decided to reorganize its divisions. In fact, they reduced their strength by 25%. Arthur Curry thought this was not the right way to go. He kept the Canadians at full strength and reorganized the battalions, adding men. Arthur Curry had constantly fought with the British on organization, on battle tactics, and usually he won his arguments. Curry was a pure operations man, and all he ever was worried about was efficiency. His argument about making divisions bigger rather than smaller is that you could use the structure that you already have, the organizational management that you already have, rather than going to more divisions and have lesser men in charge. He didn't feel they had the staffs there to make more divisions because originally they wanted a Canadian Army with five divisions. Well, he wasn't up to this at all. He'd probably be the Army commander, but he thought the Corps the way it was was most efficient, and he did everything to preserve that operational efficiency. He added more engineers and more machine gunners, so a Canadian division was completely different than the British division. Secondly, there was a change in the culture of the Canadian Corps. They became very proud of their national heritage. They became proud of the Corps. They had a sense of pride that was unique to the Canadians. The type of discipline in Canadian armies varied from that in European armies, where all classes were brought up with respect for rank amounting almost to veneration. This is an attitude totally foreign to Canadians, who are unaccustomed to showing deference to anyone who could not stand firmly on his own two feet without the artificial support of wealth or titles. And this is why they were so strong when they attacked at Amiens. In the spring of 1918, the Germans had made their last great thrust to win the Great War. They had advanced their front 60 kilometers in some areas, but they'd also depleted their men and left themselves extremely vulnerable. The Germans had faced the Canadians throughout 1917, and they had never won a battle. The Canadians had pushed them back at Vimy, at Arleux, at Frenois, at Hill 70, at Passchendaele. The Canadians had won every time. The Germans knew in 1918 the Canadians were out there somewhere. That meant there was a counteroffensive coming. Amiens was Arthur Curry's first great victory, and what he did here was simply amazing. He managed to sneak down a force of 100,000 men from Arras here to Amiens without being detected. 
So when they came down to Amiens, every soldier had in his pay book, keep your mouth shut, because this was going to be a surprise operation. And he used a number of techniques to do this, including sending some men up to Yip, sending out false radio signals. He really deceived the Germans because he knew they were watching his every move. So the fact that he could get 100,000 men down here in secret was simply spectacular. What worried me more than the actual operation itself was getting the troops and guns into position without arousing any suspicion on the part of the Bosch. All movement for many miles behind our lines had to be carried out at night. The move was so hurried and the necessity of secrecy so urgent that many things which are normally done in preparation for an attack had to be left undone. The problem with coming down here in secret and keeping the whole operation a secret was that Curry's men did not have an opportunity to reconnoiter the positions they would be attacking. They couldn't put the Canadians in the front lines because maybe a trench raid or something else, they'd find out the Canadians were there. Therefore, they attacked blind on August 8th, 1918. Curry attacked with three divisions in the line and he came across these fields. It's a pie-shaped battlefield, and it heads towards Amiens. And over here, you had the second division. You had your first division coming across the fields we're on right now. And then to the south, you had the third division attacking. It had worked perfectly. They had caught the Germans completely by surprise. And by the end of the day on August 8th, they had advanced 12 kilometers. They had captured 8,000 prisoners, three, 400 machine guns, 100 artillery pieces. It had been a complete success. In fact, the Germans called it the Black Day of the German Army or the catastrophe of the German Army. And it was after this, the generals who were demoralized thought they should sue for peace. Later on, they changed their mind and they would fight it out for the next few months. But Amiens certainly was the turning point. The Canadians renewed the attack on August 9th, liberating dozens of French villages, including Bacquar. This is Bokwar, New British Cemetery on the Amiens battlefield. The Canadian graves here belong to the later stages of the Battle of Amiens and illustrate the enormous cost of the victory. This is the grave of Major Leonard Drummond Hay Military Cross, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. My great uncle served as an officer in the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry from 1916 through to 1919 and only one of his letters survives, and it's about the action at Parvillers, August 14th, 1918. The Fritz were all around us. We tried to get to close quarters with them as they were among the buildings. The company commander, Major Drummond Hay, was putting up a fight. When a bullet hit one of the men, went right through his stomach and into my knee. And I was just going to speak to Drummond when he fell like a log and said, John, I'm done. I tried to get him to his feet, but he fell dead right in my arms. But today, the big attack has started again. I'll bet the Huns were wishing they had never been born, as our staff are determined to keep the Hun on the run. My interest in the Great War cemeteries goes back 30 years. I was traveling through Europe, through France in particular, on the Amiens battlefield, when I came across a small, beautiful cemetery. And it contained all Canadians, and they were all killed 8th of August, 1918. And this made my curiosity run wild. I went around cemetery to cemetery, and each one was August 1918, August 1918. And this forced me to look at each cemetery as an historical event. And the men buried there gave you the details of that history. The graves here are all 9th of August, 1918, 9th of August, 1918, 9th of August, 1918. They're all Canadians killed in the Battle of Amiens. From the north end of the cemetery, you get a great view of the Canadian battlefield of August 9th, 1918. The Battle of Amiens was one of Arthur Curry's masterpieces. The 3rd and 4th Canadian divisions pushed across these fields, but on August 10th, 
the German resistance stiffened. After two days of fighting, on August the 10th, they hit an old trench system from 1916. It was German and French trenches, natural defensive position for the Germans. Curry tried to push his men through for three or four days, but when he realized the Germans were putting up a stiff fight and bringing in reinforcements after reinforcements, he decided that this was not a good proposition. He went to the general in charge, which was General Rawlinson, and suggested we call the battle off and we move the Canadians back up north. They then went to Douglas Haig, the commander in chief, with the same argument, and in the end, Curry prevailed. 16 German divisions have been identified, of which four have been completely routed. 10,000 prisoners have passed through our cages and casualties stations. 25 towns and villages have been rescued from the clutch of the invaders. Two weeks after the Battle of Amiens, Curry's Canadian Corps were ordered to make another assault against the formidable German positions east of Arras. Their target would be the vital German transport center, the city of Cambrai. We're on the road to uh, Nouvelle Vitasse, and I'm going to try to find the location of the Canadian Corps headquarters in September 1918. They had followed the Canadian advance of August. Now Curry was moving them up closer to the front. Many of the historical locations associated with Arthur Curry are not marked. There is no way to find them except through primary research and poring over old maps, looking in the old books. There is nothing to indicate where this great man once served and where he made his greatest decisions. What I'm trying to do is locate the precise location of Curry's headquarters. And we have a few descriptions of it from memoirs, and we know it was somewhere along this road between Nouvelle Vitasse and Wancourt. And it was in a muddy dugout area. It was not a very nice, not the chateau they were used to. It was in a muddy, sunken road. And I believe from all the locations, we're gonna find it just down here. So we have to cut up towards Wancourt and try to find Curry's headquarters. The map indicated there's a sunken road uh, about 100 yards in front of us off to the left. And based on the description, this is where Curry's headquarters would have been. This is the location of Canadian Corps headquarters for the entire month of September. And of course, down here, you'd have all the communications, you'd have all the dugouts. You're still close enough uh, for enemy fire, so you have to be very careful. But you can imagine this area, the transport going back and forth along the roads, communications to the other part of the sector, all down here. So troops are going in and out, ambulances, guns are moving up because they got to get much closer to the next phase of the operation. So this was a hive of activity. And this is sort of very cool that you're able to find uh, such a neat location. The Battle of Arras began on August 26, 1918. As the attack moved on, Curry moved his headquarters up from Noël Vion to here so he could be closer to the action. And it's quite amazing that the corps commander is going to be this close to the front, and the divisional commanders are going to be even closer. So this sort of is a, a different world from, let's say, the Second World War. So they're moving up in this area, and this was a huge battlefield. This is just, this is just the first couple days we're seeing when you compare this to other Canadian battlefields. It's, it's just huge. And of course, they're only attacking with two divisions. At Passchendaele, they attacked with two divisions, and it was this big. This thing is like 100 times bigger. And they're moving and moving and moving, and the Germans can't stop them. The first phase of Curry's offensive broke through a series of German lines. But casualties were heavy. 5,000 Canadians were killed or wounded. After six days of heavy fighting, the Canadians were preparing the last phase of the battle, the assault on the drocourt quiant line. When you discuss the 100 days and the effect of the 100 days on the war, there's no doubt it shortened the war. And Curry himself was never clear which battle was the greatest, Amiens or Arras, but many people considered victory here at the Arras, the DQ line, as the greatest victory of the Western Front. 
I'm near the Arras Cambrai Road, and I'm looking for artifacts of the Battle of Arras, 1918. And here's a surface find over here. This is a big hunk of shell, and it was probably fired during the last phase of the Battle of Arras. It was to be Arthur Curry's greatest victory, the battle for the Drocourt Quiant line. The Drocourt Quiant line was a massive trench system built as an extension of the Hindenburg line. It had two trenches, 250 yards apart, and belts and belts of barbed wire in front of it. It ran across this field just near the horizon, across the field, and over. Curry's plan was to attack with his 4th Division between the village of Jury and the main road. South of the road, it was going to be the 1st Division. And his idea was to break through this massive fortification. Curry's rule was you had to be within 500 yards of the trench before you'd make your attack. A wide no man's land was death. So what he had to do is get his men in place and beat back the Germans, because the Germans realized this position was critical. They were moving up specialist battalions to try to stop the Canadians. Curry's tactics, which he had formulated in the spring and early summer of 1918, was to deploy his engineers and his artillery to support his infantry. You have to remember their experience against the British in 17. These positions had held out for months. Now you've got the Canadians coming through here in hours. And at some point, the Germans, who had the Canal du Nord behind them, had to make a decision. Stay and fight and risk losing their artillery or pull the artillery back and evacuate. 2nd of September, 1918. This morning at 5 o'clock, the Drocourt Quéant was assaulted on a frontage of 7,000 yards. The 1st Division have pushed on. All our first objective was captured on time. And by September the 5th, the Germans had pulled back to the Canal du Nord. As a result of our victory yesterday, the hinge of the German system has been broken. It is a question whether our victory of yesterday or of August 8th is the greatest, but I'm inclined to think that yesterday's was. It was a glorious victory, and I am sure the people of Canada will be proud. Words cannot express the pride one feels in being associated with such splendid soldiers. The only regret one has, and it is a very sincere one, is that one has lost so many gallant comrades, men whom a young country like Canada could ill afford to lose. These sunken roads often show evidence of the Great War. This one was used by British, German, and Canadian troops. And often, if you look in the side here, you'll find evidence of dugouts or somebody's been digging here. On August 26, 1918, the Canadians blew through this area. And shortly after, afterwards, the headquarters rolled through. And of course, with them came the war correspondents. And this is where they set up their Armstrong huts. It was during this operation that Curry showed a part of his personality nobody had ever seen. Curry was a very aloof individual to some. He was shy to others. He was six foot three. He was overweight. He was the only British general not to have a mustache. He didn't fit the symbol of a gallant major general. And to some extent, that affected him. But during these operations, when he was getting the casualty lists and thousands and thousands of his boys were being killed and wounded, he came to the correspondent's hut and broke down. We were seated one disastrous day in our Armstrong hut work in our typewriters. When the door opened and General Curry stepped in, I saw in his face a story of tragic suffering. Without a word, he dropped into a chair and buried his face in his arms. His heavy body shook with sobs. After about five minutes, he regained his self-control, rose, and walked out. Once again, the grim soldier he had to be. This beautiful sunken road is just east of the village of Quion. In 1918, it had been a German command center. And on September 28th, Arthur Curry brought his Canadian headquarters here. The Canadians liked their new accommodations. They had been built by the Germans as part of the support line of the Drocourt Quiant line. They were 30 feet deep, they had canvas walls, they had everything the Canadians needed. But on October 14th, Curry got bad news. His best friend, Louis Lipset, 
had been killed. Louis Lipset was a regular British Army officer who had chosen to serve with the Canadians in 1914. He had served with distinction in every battle, Second Yeep, the Somme, Vimy, and Passchendaele. And he had been with Arthur Curry from the very beginning in 1914. The funeral procession for Louis Lipset was a somber affair. It was attended by Julian Bing, Arthur Curry, the Prince of Wales. He had an honor guard of the 8th Battalion, which had been his first unit, and he commanded them at 2nd Ypres. There's elements of the 3rd Division, which he commanded for three years. He was Canada's unsung general of the Great War. And this is his grave. Major General Louis Lipset, CB, CMG, Royal Irish Regiment, commanding 4th Division, killed in action October 14th, 1918, 44 years old. The inscription reads, out of the stress of the doing, into the peace of the done. Within three weeks of the Battle of Ras, Curry and the Canadians are once again asked to attack a formidable position. We're driving from Jury to the Canal du Nord, towards the final decisive battle of the last hundred days of the Great War. This is the Canal du Nord. And after the Canadian victory at the drocourt quiant line, the German army pulled back behind this position with the objective of protecting Cambrai, their most important transport and munitions hub. They had three or four lines of defense and this is what Arthur Curry was faced with when he was given the objective of taking Cambrai. And now against the Canal du Nord, he had another problem. His line was blocked by a canal and 28 German divisions. So he was outnumbered and he had a terrible obstacle in front of his advancing troops. So he came up with the strategic plan, which is probably his most brilliant of the entire war, and that was the crossing of the Canal du Nord. What happened in this area, for about a mile and a half, the canal bed was under construction prior to the war and it was dry. So Curry's plan was to use 60,000 men, hide them in the trees in behind here, and then in the middle of the night, launch an attack over the dry canal bed, pierce the German positions, fan out, and drive on Cambrai. He had a discussion with Julian Bing, his mentor, and Bing said, man, it's magnificent, but do you really think you can do it? Curry had such confidence in his men that he knew that they could execute this. During the night of September 27, 1918, the Canadians launched their attack across the dry canal bed and drove towards Cambrai. The attack on the Canal du Nord began at 5.30 a.m. Troops and guns and tanks have succeeded in crossing the canal. The fighting was quite severe in spots. We captured a German battery. Among the prisoners was a count. He paid a great tribute to the attack as carried out this morning and stated further that in the German army, everyone agreed that the Canadian troops were most to be feared in all the Allied armies. We have overcome the obstacle of the canal and in a few days should take Cambrai. But like any battle, there was terrible costs associated with the victory. One thousand Canadians were killed crossing the Canal du Nord, and they rest in six war cemeteries scattered in the farmland of the Nord region of France. These cemeteries are very rarely visited, and that makes them even more poignant. This is Quarry Wood Cemetery, and it contains 200 graves of men killed in the crossing of the Canal du Nord. This is the grave of an exceptionally brave soldier, Lieutenant Arthur Kilborn, Distinguished Service Order, Military Cross, and Military Medal. Three decorations for bravery, two as an officer, and one when he was in the ranks. 
only two Canadians won this array of decorations. He finally met his end here at the Canal du Nord, September 27, 1918. The first day of the attack had gone exactly as Arthur Currie had planned it. But over the next few days, German resistance would stiffen and the Canadians would pay dearly to capture Cambrai. As the Canadians drove towards Cambrai, the Germans, desperate to save this strategic city, threw thousands of soldiers against the Canadian attacks. Finally, on October 9, 1918, the Germans were forced to evacuate Cambrai. But before they left, they looted the city and set it on fire. This is Canada Cemetery, and it contains 240 men killed in the final attempt to capture Cambrai at the end of September, October 1918. Arthur Currie's campaign had started off extremely well, crossing the Canal du Nord and pushing close to Cambrai. But as he got close to encircling it, the Germans threw in reserve after reserve. Finally, on October 1st, 1918, he threw in his depleted battalions in one last attempt to encircle the town and to drive the Germans out. A week later, under pressure from the South and the Canadian advance, the Germans withdrew from Cambrai and Arthur Currie had his third great victory of the Hundred Days. The Germans have fought us here very, very hard, where we were counterattacked by eight German divisions, all quite willing to die, coming right at us, determined to kill everyone if they could get through. And we were determined that we would kill every one of them rather than let them get through. I want you to understand what war is, and you cannot have war without the inevitable price. This is the grave of Lance Sergeant GM Matthew, military medal and bar. That means he won it twice. And he served with the 52nd Battalion, Northern Ontario Canadian Infantry. And he was killed in action in the final attempt to encircle Cambrai, October 1st, 1918. And he was 28 years old. It says, a beautiful life, stainless and brave. Cambrai was the last great battle fought by the Canadians during the Great War. And for Arthur Currie, it was his third major success. For the Canadians at home, all they saw were the casualty lists, 42,000 names, including 12,000 dead. For in the newspapers, these were all listed as British victories. They never understood the importance played by the Canadians and by Sir Arthur Currie during these battles. So back home in Canada, he remained unappreciated. Going to the city of Valenciennes, which was the last Canadian set piece victory of the Great War. After Cambrai, the Germans were essentially on the run and they were looking for an opportunity to get a defensive line. And they tried to dig in around Valenciennes. And of course, Arthur Curry's Canadian Corps was going to take care of them. And that's exactly what they did. Curry brings up the artillery and literally blast them out. They found over 800 bodies on the battlefield after they came through. Valenciennes is a very minor battle in terms of uh, the Hundred Days or the First World War. And there's so many forgotten battles, and it's just one of them. This is Place de Canada in downtown Valenciennes. And today is just a car park, but in 1918 it was something special. On November 2nd, 1918, the Canadian Corps had captured Valenciennes and liberated the people. As a consequence of this, they wanted to show some appreciation to the Canadians, so they named this square after Canada. Valenciennes had been Canada's last set-piece battle of the First World War, and it was a magnificent victory. They only lost 75 men killed and about 300 wounded. And they had taken over a city, very, very difficult terrain to fight in. 
It was Arthur Curry's masterful leadership that brought them to this great event. It was a great victory for the Canadians. After the fall of Valenciennes, the Canadians were ordered to pursue the retreating Germans to the city of Mons. The capture of Mons would be the crowning achievement of the Canadian Corps. The Corps had continuously gone against difficult German positions and drove the Germans back again and again to a point that they were in full retreat. Now the Canadians had to keep pressure on the Germans up to the very last moment to make sure they signed the armistice. German military power must now be irretrievably crushed. That is the end we must obtain if we have the will and the guts to see it through. We do not want to have to do this thing all over again in another 15 or 20 years. During the assault on Mons, the Germans continued to put up a stiff fight, and 30 Canadian soldiers were killed on the last day of the Great War. And it's always difficult in the Great War, where you have just thousands and thousands of soldiers being killed, that the last few hold such significance. No one wants to be the last one killed in a war. This is the town square of Mons, and they're having a grand fete right now. On the morning of November the 11th, 1918, the Canadians received the news that the armistice had been signed. Soldiers of the 42nd Battalion, Black Watch, came into the Grand Place of Mons. Finally, the Great War was over. This is one of the few reminders of the Canadian liberation of Mons from the First World War. And it's a plaque that was put up right afterwards. And it commemorates the 50 months of occupation by the German forces and the liberation by the Canadians on November 10th, 1918. This is the original Mons monkey. And like any good Canadian tourist, I bought my own. But obviously, I'm not the first Canadian tourist to come here, and on November the 11th, 1918, the Canadian Corps, led by Sir Arthur Curry, led their victory parade through the Grand Place. And there were thousands of Belgians cheering them on. They had been under occupation for four years, and finally their day of liberation had come. For the Canadians, it was a grand finale for the 100 days. The capture of Mons was the last act in Arthur Curry's war. 30 Canadians have been killed in the attack, and they are buried in the civilian cemetery at Mons, not far from the Grand Place. This is Mons Communal Cemetery, and the Canadian graves are at the top of the hill. 10th of November, 1918. Both divisions reached Mons, where they encountered heavy machine gun fire. I gave instructions that if the town could be captured without many casualties, the pressure should be continued. Shortly after midnight, the 42nd Battalion entered the city. Some fighting took place through the streets where I saw dead bodies later in the day. The German machine gunners defending the positions remained at their posts until they were either killed or captured. This is the war graves plot in this impressive cemetery and most of the Canadians buried here were killed at Mons, November the 10th, 1918. This is the grave of Tommy Mills, 42nd Battalion, Black Watch of Canada, Canadian Infantry, and he was killed November the 10th. Mills was a friend of Will Byrd, and in his memoir, Ghosts Have Warm Hands, Byrd recounted how Mills died the last night of the war. Byrd, it was the voice of the company sergeant major, harsh as a whipsaw. Get your section at once. Battle order. We're going to take Mons. Tom Mills and his brother Jim are on their feet. The war is over tomorrow and everyone knows it. What kind of rot is this? 
The Sergeant Major's face is pale and set. He was not speaking in his normal voice at all. Orders are orders. Get your gear. The Hun began to shell with shrapnel and tear gas. There was a despairing cry behind me. I swung around to see Tom Mills falling. His brother caught him, but he had to let him down. I'm hit, Tom said, and held out his arm. But as he sank back on the floor, I saw he had a fearful wound on the stomach. He died as we looked at him. Jim Mills is wild-eyed. He says he's gonna shoot whoever arranged to have his brother killed for nothing. He really means it. He's hoping Curry comes here today. If he doesn't, he's gonna shoot the next higher up. He says his brother was murdered. An officer says, take Jim and get him drunk. So drunk he won't know anything for 24 hours. Then it'll be too late, and he'll forget all about it. The capture of Mons was the crowning achievement for the Canadian Corps, and by great war standards, casualties were few. But there's something different about the men who died the last day of the war, and those men would haunt Arthur Curry. This is the town of Coburg, along the shores of Lake Ontario. And in the months after the war, Arthur Curry stayed in Europe, where he was feted by kings, royalty, and all dignitaries. Treated like the great general that he was. In August 1919, he sailed for home, and when he arrived at Halifax, there was no hero's welcome. The docks were empty. There was nobody there. And unfortunately, it was a sign of things to come. This is the war memorial in Coburg, and it was raised by the citizens of Coburg to honor their fallen of the Great War. Most of those men would have been killed in the victorious campaigns serving with the Canadian Corps under Sir Arthur Currie. When Arthur Currie returned from Europe, there was a very strange reception from the government. They didn't treat him the same way as other generals. Most British generals got cash rewards. They gave him a, a lesser job in the military rather than the top job which he had deserved, and they didn't give him any official praise. It was a strange silence for a man who had done so much for Canada and so much for the Canadian government. The question is, why did the Canadian government treat Curry so shamefully? And we don't really know why, but we can speculate in a few areas. The first one is that the government and the Canadian public were war weary, and they wanted nothing more to do with the war. The second thing we could speculate is political gamesmanship, because Sir Robert Borden was a conservative and Mackenzie King was the liberal leader. And both these men could see Arthur Curry as a rival, as Curry was such a famous Canadian and he had political leanings to both sides. But thirdly, and probably most importantly, the Canadian public and the Canadian government did not understand the importance of Arthur Curry's victories in the last hundred days of the war. His victories at Amiens, Arras, and Cambrai had shortened the war, and they were decisive and massive victories. But in the press, they were portrayed as British victories. All the Canadian public or the Canadian government saw was the enormous casualty list from the 100 days, 42,000 Canadian men killed, wounded, or missing. This is the campus of McGill University. In 1920, Curry was awarded the principalship of McGill University, and his office was over here in the Arts Building. This is the lobby of the old Arts Building at McGill. And in our search for the story of Sir Arthur Curry, we have found very little evidence of this great man. Here's an example here. Sir Arthur Curry, Principal of McGill, 1920 to 1933. We're gonna go upstairs and find his office to see where he made a lot of his big decisions. 
We know from memoirs, particularly that of his secretary, and also from newspaper articles, that it's one of these doors on the second floor. And based on the location and other information, I believe it's actually number 210. It's now a student's common room. By the mid-20s, Curry was very dissatisfied at the treatment he and the Canadian Corps had received from the government. But it was really an article in a small town paper that forced him to action. In 1928, he decided to sue to save his reputation. There was much waste of human life during the war, enormous loss of lives which should not have taken place. But it is doubtful whether in any case there was a more deliberate and useless waste of human life than in the so-called capture of Mons. This is the courthouse where the greatest libel trial in Canadian history took place. Arthur Curry was so incensed by the article in the Port Hope Evening Guide that he wanted a retraction. They accused him of taking Mons for his own glorification and of wasting the lives of his men. It was the last day, the last hour, and the last minute. When to glorify the Canadian headquarters staff, the Commander-in-Chief conceived the mad idea that it would be a fine thing to say that the Canadians had fired the last shot in the Great War. He felt this was vicious and untrue, and he wanted a retraction. For some reason, the men in charge of the Port Hope paper refused to do so, and Arthur Curry was forced to sue for libel. And the trial started here, April 16, 1928. The trial was a huge media event, and on the 11th day of the trial, Arthur Curry was called to the witness box. He was cross-examined for almost seven hours straight, and nonetheless, he held his ground. I don't know how we would have had the temerity to stop fighting on the 9th. We had done much, and we would have been the only corps to lie down and quit. Canadians do not lie down and quit within two days of victory. When the trial finally ended, the jury went to deliberate, and after three and a half hours, they found in Arthur Curry's favor. He had won another victory. Arthur Curry returned triumphantly to Montreal. There was much celebration and many congratulations. And there's actually a beautiful speech he wrote at this time, talking about how he had won his case, but he'd also defended his beloved Canadian Corps. Ten years have passed since we came home, and we have never been more united. Once more, we've come through a dirty fight, and once more, we've won. The Corps is once more united as it was in the fields of France and Flanders. Arthur Curry was always a man of fragile health, and this trial took a great deal out of him. He was sick for almost a year afterwards, and he never truly recovered. Arthur Curry died November the 30th, 1933. After a short illness of three weeks, he died in the Royal Victoria Hospital, Montreal. His body has been lying in state in Christ Church Cathedral. All day long, thousands of mourners filed past the bier to gaze for the last time upon the face of the dead and leading men of Canada and citizens from many walks of life, all were present. This is Christchurch Cathedral on St. Catherine Street, in Montreal, and it was here on December the 5th, 1933, that Arthur Curry had his funeral service. After the service, his casket was brought through these doors, loaded in a hearse, and taken on up to McGill University. It would have been his 58th birthday. The procession moves slowly up University Street. The students and the graduates are taking the body of their principal to the campus of McGill. There, the casket is placed upon the gun carriage. The Union Jack is draped over it. The naked sword and khaki cap are placed upon it. As the procession moves off, in front of the gun carriage is a full military escort for a general. With slow step beside them march the pallbearers, eight generals, his brothers in arms. And for the last time, 
The devoted corps commander is in the midst of his devoted men. Immediately behind the gun carriage is the general's charger, with boots reversed in the stirrups, and the empty sword scabbard hanging from an empty saddle. The gun carriage was brought through the Roddick Memorial Gates, which incidentally Curry had built in 1924. It's hard to imagine today, with Sherbrooke being so busy and so noisy, the silence of that December day. The procession had started at the Roddick Gates, come down Sherbrooke Street, and throughout there was a tremendous sense of affection and sadness for Arthur Curry. More than 200,000 Montrealers lined the streets. The military entourage was also exceptional. You had bands, and you had cavalry, you had infantry. They came up to this area, stopped here. At the Karshi Monument, the procession halts. With bared heads, the students, the veterans, and civilians take their leave. And then proceeded up to Mount Royal. And the sad journey to the place of burial is resumed. A great body of veterans following their leader for the last time. The gun carriage passes through the gates of the cemetery, and the body is borne to the grave. The mourners gather round. The chaplain takes his place. By the time the procession arrived, the light was failing, and there were hundreds of mourners already in place. And then it came time for the committal service. The casket was taken from the gun carriage and brought over the grave. The archdeacon read the committal service, and Arthur Curry was lowered into the ground. They then played the last post, followed by Reveille, and the great general was gone. Then, as the body is committed to the ground, I heard the solemn words of the service for the burial of the dead. We therefore commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, Dust to dust. Arthur Curry was the most outstanding general of the Great War. No one came close to his successes, yet he remains unknown and ignored. To me, he was a military genius, and he was our genius. And it's about time he got the credit that is due to him. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, Whatever more.